many of our clients who are CFOs or investor relations team at insurance companies routinely ask, so what could we do differently and what could we do to better? And hearing directly from the horse's mouth, the, the users themselves is, is very, very helpful. You're listening to Rethinking Insurance, a podcast series from WTW, where we discuss the issues facing PNC, life, and composite insurers around the globe, as well as exploring the latest tools, techniques, and innovations that will help you rethink insurance. Hello, and welcome to Rethinking Insurance. I'm your host, Kunj Maheshwari, and today I'm delighted to be joined by my guests, Anshul Garg and Kamran Parugi. Welcome both, and thank you for joining me. Thanks, Kunj. Oh, thanks for having me here, Kunj. This is the second of a two-part podcast series on IFRS 17. As a reminder to those guests who are not so familiar with IFRS 17, it is the first global attempt at a concise, coherent, and consistent global accounting standard for insurers, worked on by the IASB for more than 20 years and has taken upwards of five and sometimes even 10 years for insurers to implement, changing fundamentally the accounting and financial reporting for the insurance sector as a whole. As per our survey that WTW has done for insurers who are preparing for IFRS 17, we have estimated that globally IFRS 17 implementations have costed the sector upwards of 20 billion USD dollars till date. In this episode, we will be discussing the results of another survey we have carried out for the analysts who are using these financial statements. We've concluded this recently and key actions for organizations and recommendations come out interestingly from this survey. Insurance consulting and technology business at WTW has been supporting insurers globally who are reporting under IFR 17, helping them to navigate this new global standard. In addition, we continue to provide consulting, technology, and outsourcing services. All in all, we have worked with close to 200 insurers on IFRS 17 aspects already, and over 80 insurers have bought our IFRS 17 technology to help deliver the IFRS 17 results. I know, Cameron, that in the last few years, we have at WTW carried out very successful surveys of the preparers of IFRS 17 statements, the insurance companies themselves where we've had participation annually by close to 300 insurers each year when we've done these surveys. Now that the insurers have started publishing IFRS 17 results in many jurisdictions around the world, what has motivated a new survey of the analysts and, and the users of these financial statements? Yeah, thanks, Kuj. I mean, you're right, we've done the preparer surveys for a number of years, uh, got very rich data out of that, including uh, our sort of 20 billion plus uh, estimate. But if you take a step back um, with all that work companies have done, I mean, the key question is always with uh, external financial reporting is, does it meet the needs of users? Um, and we do have very good connections with the investor community. And so we're very keen to actually touch base with them this year in June, sort of, you know, companies had published a lot all the way up to uh, April, in certain cases, early May, and it took a while to digest all that information. So touching base with the investors and analysts representing the investors about, you know, what their thoughts of IFRS 17, you know, I thought was a very important step in sort of uh, judging, you know, early stages views of whether IFRS 17 has been a success or not. Right. No, thank you from my perspective, Cameron, for leading this initiative on doing an analyst survey of users because many of our clients who are CFOs or investor relations team at insurance companies routinely ask, so what could we do differently and what could we do to better? And hearing directly from the horse's mouth, the, the users themselves is, is very, very helpful. And I'm not aware of any similar initiative being undertaken where IFRS 17 statements, users are are given the opportunity or platform uh, to, pr to provide comments and recommendations directly to, to the insurer. So this is this is a great initiative. So Anshul, I, I know you've been uh, at the epicenter of uh, looking at all the data and all the results and all of the survey responses. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's the nature of responses? How many responses have you got? And what's been the 
profile of respondents? What kind of analysts have responded? Right. So we reached out uh, to several analysts and we have responses from about 14 analysts and we have covered a wide spectrum uh, of analysts ranging from equity side to debt side and uh, ranging from buy side as well as sell side. So that that just helps get more perspective, more varied perspective. So we'll try to keep that wide. Now, in terms of what did we ask the analysts? So we approached them with four questions, four very specific questions. The first one of them being, what's the biggest improvement that they saw in the disclosures of the insurers? The second being, what's the most negative effect they saw on the insurer's uh, disclosures? And then we asked them uh, for one recommendation to improve the disclosures. And finally, if there's any material change that they've made there to their analysis in analyzing the ins- insurance sector as a whole. So those were the four questions uh, that we posed to them. And uh, we got some really great insights uh, coming out of that. That's very interesting. So when you say debt analysts, you mean the credit rating agencies, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, that's great. So we've covered both buy and sell side equity as well as credit rating agencies. So what have been the most interesting takeaways from these four questions? The the positive, the negative, how have the analysis changed and what are the recommendations? Well, for me, I would say that the most important takeaway has been that the impact on the industry has been varied for so for life side the impact has been more so mixed in nature with some positive reviews and some negative ones on the non life side it has largely been viewed as being negatively impacted so when i'm talking about the impact on the life side so analysts are really liking the concept of csm So it's sort of giving them a measure of economic value and helping them gain better visibility into the life profits. So they're really happy with that. However, they feel that the disclosures for CSM, uh, particularly for the new business, are not sufficiently granular and there's scope uh, for uh, increasing the granularity there. On the non-life side, the analysts have complained that uh, the standard has sort of made things more complex. So they were used to more simpler things and uh, the standard has just introduced a whole lot of complexity into uh, the disclosures and into the analysis. And uh, some of them are also unhappy with the effects of discounting and the resulting volatility that it introduces. So that's the that's the sort of impact that's seen across the sector from life to non-life, from positive to the negatives. And in terms of the recommendations that the analysts have made, I would say the biggest one of them would be that analysts feel that there needs to be greater consistency and greater granularity in disclosure. So when we're talking about IFRS 17, one of the biggest merits of the standard which has been talked about is that it sort of creates a the same platform it introduces that uh, comparability uh, across companies however the choices that have been provided by the standard uh, and their different application by different companies has led to disconnect between uh, different companies and uh, has made the comparability a little difficult so some consistency in the formats and uh, some more granularity in the results that the insurers provide would be helpful as viewed by the analysts so Anshul, you talked about some interesting changes to the analyst analysis of value from insurance companies. What has been the most important change there? So I would I would say that the most important change would be that ratios like uh, price to earnings and return on equity, these have become more important with a very clear description of equity, which for say life insurance uh, would be the IFRS equity plus CSM. So these ratios are being tracked by the analysts in much more closely now and maybe something which the companies would then have to monitor more closely as uh, as we go along. Right. That's that's very interesting, Anshul. Thank you very much. And Cameron, from, from your experience and what we've learned from this analysis, How do you see the responses being varied or different across geographies between Europe and Asia that being touted as one of the greatest benefits of IFRS 17 that 
that one can now compare across geographies. So how do you see the analysts' responses being different across regions, as well as maybe between equity and debt analysts or credit rating analysts? Yeah, sure, Kunj. And, and, and Angela, just to say, I found your comments there very, very insightful and, and really great to see that coming out of our survey. From a sort of Europe versus Asia perspective, and I'll, I'll talk in general terms, and of course, it's it's always dangerous to talk in general terms. Specific insurers might be uh, in a very different position of specific countries or markets. But in general terms, bear in mind that uh, for, for quite a, many years now, at least sort of 10, 15, 20 years, Asia Pacific has been seen as uh, much more of a growth area than than the, than the sort of, uh, UK continent of Europe. Um, we have seen in continent of Europe and UK the adoption of Solvency II being a very significant uh, development eight years ago and continues to be. Obviously, very recently, we've started to see some changes there, uh, both in the UK and continent Europe. And from a sort of point of view of insurers reporting to the market, we've seen many companies in Europe replacing embedded value and value new business type of reporting with something actually very similar, but called very different, called adjusted solvency two, where they make clear they start with a solvency two approach both a sort of valuation of assets as liabilities or own funds, as it's called in Solvency 2, and then making adjustment to be more from a shareholder perspective, um, and, and then doing something similar in terms of the impact on new business sold in the year. And there, uh, it's quite interesting. We see companies, many of them continue to focus on that as a key metric, talking about the so-called cash that's often a very Solvency 2 linked uh, metric, uh, distributable um, surplus being generated out of um, Solvency 2, effectively own funds, less some allowance, uh, some proportion of Solvency capital ratio. And we've seen the analysts continue to sort of focus on that information. In fact, we've seen a number of analysts um, talk about how they are, are focusing more on that in the early days of IFR 17 as they get used to IFR 17 numbers. So I thought that was a very interesting development, almost the, the reverse of perhaps what the ISB wanted there. For Asia Pac, still in many markets, embedded value and value new business, uh, particularly the growth market, is a very important metric often driven from local statutory or regulatory accounting and not uh, any IFR 17 uh, linked account sort of starting point. And again, the Asia Pacific companies doing that are still continuing with EV and VNB reporting and the, and the analysts almost saying that they're hoping that continues for a while longer um, while they get used to IFR 17 metrics. So as a, as a general point there, I'd say in both markets, and they're still wanting to see the other metrics that companies have been reporting in the last few years continue for the next few years. It's just the types of those metrics are quite different. So I think that answers your first question, Kunj. I think you had a second question for me about equity versus debt analyst. Is that right? That is correct. That is correct. How do we see maybe credit ratings getting affected because of IFRS 17, if at all? Yeah, one, one interesting thing from the credit rating agencies and debt analysts is uh, a very strong message that overall they see no impact whatsoever uh, in the short term of IFRS 17 on the ratings themselves. Um, now, perhaps that might change over time. We have seen uh, a, a number of the rating agencies quite publicly um, talk about um, how they bring IFRS 17 or IFRS generally and therefore IFRS 17 into the some of the numbers they use for the ratings. And I, I think they also make the point that there's lots of other numbers they bring in that uh, nothing to do with IFRS. And that might help explain uh, the lack of impact. Also, they always emphasize that a lot of their rating process is qualitatively driven rather than quantitatively driven. And I think that also helps explain the lack of impact. Um, but they have been uh, quite vocal about being willing uh, under certain circumstances to add all or, or a significant proportion of the so-called contractual service margin that Andrew, you were talking about earlier uh, into the equity when they are assessing their, you know, bringing their information into their own ratings, including, for example, working out uh, leverage ratios. So that, that, that's quite an interesting development uh, on, on that side. I'd say the equity analysts, it does seem that IFRS 17 has triggered in certain areas um, more questions or more uh, 
uh, understanding or more uncertainty, particularly where the nature of RF-17 means there's a, a greater light shone on particular points um, in in the market. Uh, and we have seen some impacts, for example, um, greater questions in certain parts of Asia, greater questions for certain products such as UK and UT. So we have seen uh, more driven by the equity analysts, uh, those sorts of uh, impacts. But these these are very interesting insights, Cameron. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, overall message, what I hear from you is while the wrapper around financial reporting does change, and while the level of detail or information available changes, um, the business fundamentals don't, which is which is helpful to know. One of the things that is interesting in this narrative is that although many jurisdictions and many insurers across the world have gone live with IFRS 17 effective 1st of January 2023 and have started reporting even fully numbers for the first time earlier this year. There are jurisdictions, particularly in Asia and, and more emerging economies such as India, Sri Lanka and elsewhere in Southeast Asia that will adopt later. And given these lessons learned, given the inputs from users and analysts, what do you think are the most important ways the late adopters can leapfrog in their implementation journey and hopefully not having to spend another $20 billion for, for the Asia pack in, in doing this implementation? Very good question. It's always, I think, an advantage to do things later than others when you can learn the lessons. And of course, the later adopters have the benefit of being able to tap into experienced resources from around the world now who have been through the fire of first time adoption. I mean, a couple of thoughts there. One is around disclosures. I think the adopters last year had to make a lot of decisions about how they're going to present things and, and the best way of showing things without having a large template of existing uh, examples. We now have many insurers, you know, so something of the order of 100 insurers publishing and some of them with uh, subsidiary accounting as well. So the real number is probably a lot higher. And we have heard from analysts, including in our survey results, some of the insurers, you know, disclosures that they really like. So I think that's a, a good lesson to be learned by the future adopters. Another one that comes to mind relates to how the programs went in practice. I, I think... In the early days, days, insurers were very ambitious and wanted to do both a sort of compliance adoption and also make sure that their reporting processes post-adoption were in very good shape so that they were leaving a very good long-term strategic solution that worked well from a business-as-usual perspective. And the practice didn't really go to plan for many insurers. Many insurers had to defer long-term strategic solutions and, and, and instead bring in short-term tactical solutions just to get the programs over the line. And like I say, if, if the new insurers adopting over the next few years could learn a practical lesson, it's to make sure that they achieve both as part of the implementation. A lot of insurers out there still with a lot of work to do to um, get their reporting processes in good shape for um, post IFRO 17 and, and, and the next few years. So that's, I think, one lesson for those markets where um, companies haven't adopted yet. Right. That's really great lessons and, and learnings. Thanks. Thanks a lot for sharing that. And I'm sure that will be very helpful for more than 10 insurers in India and Sri Lanka who have purchased WTW's technology for IFRS 17 recently. And we continue to talk to several more in, in the region as well as in the markets on adopting WTW technology and, and the lessons that you've mentioned will come in really, really handy for, for the implementation journey. I'm glad, the I'm glad you mentioned that, Cringe, because I forgot to mention that. And clearly, that is the most important thing insurers should be doing. So, so, so yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this, this has been really insightful from both Anshul and Cameron. Thank, thank you very much. So maybe before we go, perhaps one parting thoughts uh, from, from both of you. If, if you were going to suggest one key takeaway or key action organizations and insurers should be taking now with regard to IFRS 17 implementation as a result of what we've heard from the analysts, then what would it be? I would say that so insurers uh, need to focus on, so rather than just focusing on churning out more disclosures, I think there needs to be a focus on making the disclosures more insightful. 
so several analysts uh, talk about talked about that and uh, personally i i have used that outcome in into the projects that i'm myself working on and trying to basically get that information that our analysts are requesting uh, early into the project rather than pondering over that later in the uh, project as to what sort of kpis should we look at or how can we make the information more insightful so that's something that i'm trying to incorporate right uh, in the middle of the project so that i'm working on to to make them more fruitful and i think an- another thing would be that several analysts have pointed out to the fact that there are some companies are putting the various information uh, about the various financial metrics at one place and that's been really appreciated by the analysts versus some companies uh, which have some information in what one place and uh, some other information at another place so that's been really frustrating for some some of so the analysts so probably something for insurers to keep in mind and try and consolidate uh, all the financial information at a single place so that it's easier for the users of uh, financial statements to go through that and do their respective analysis right and easier for us too because we've been benchmarking all of these disclosures as well so <laughs> help yeah, have them in one place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. definitely that will be helpful. um right and and kamran what about from yourself what what would be sort of the key action or takeaway that you would recommend for organizations and insurers around the world well the danger is always going second is that Anshul, that was a great uh, response and uh, also thanks to the analysts who um, made made those sort of points I mean, I've got one thought and something we've spotted in our own analysis is the different ways insurers have presented key results and particular things like analysis and movement and uh, sensitivities. And those different templates are are somewhat a source of frustration because it it creates uh, noise in the system. It creates uh, more time to work out what's going on. And that does remind me of the CFO forum, which in the old days used to do a great job of creating standardized uh, templates. In fact, they, I remember they published one as part of their MCV principles in June 2008. And and that that one appendix uh, template became probably the most useful thing that I can think of that they ever published. So I wonder if there's an organization like that that is willing to take the lead in agreeing a new or a very small number of templates that insurers could use for their investor presentations to help communicate the key IFRS results. And and as part of that, I think there's always a need to help explain how those IFRS results link to other key metrics. So to bear that bit in mind as well. So that would be my wish for the sector. The CFO Forum could do that. That's great. And we're happy to advise and support on that as anyone would wish, uh, as we have done in the past. So we ha- that is the sort of thing we've done uh, over the years. And I think there is a need for that now, having having looked at a number of companies' publications uh, at year-end uh, 2023. That would indeed be wonderful. Thanks, thanks, Cameron. And I think we're coming up to close. So thank you, Cameron and Anshul, for joining me today. It was great to hear your perspectives. And of course, to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us. Just as a reminder, if you work for an insurance company, and wish to discuss any of this content in more depth with any of our IFRS 17 experts, including the speakers here today, please get in touch with your usual WTW consultant. And if you heard something about the surveys we've done that interested you or the IFRS 17 literature that we published or technology capabilities that we have, you can visit wtwco.com slash IFRS 17 or write to us directly on ICT at the rate wtwco.com. Finally, if you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe and we'll see you again on the next episode of Rethinking Insurance. Thank you for joining us for this WTW podcast featuring the latest perspectives on the intersection of people, capital, and risk. For more information, visit the insights section of wtwco.com. This podcast is for general discussion and or information only, is not intended to be relied upon, and action based on or in connection with anything contained herein should not be taken without first obtaining specific advice from a suitably qualified professional.